so but it was a uh, <laughs> <laughs> that gives you a reason to finish it yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah I was just like a student in my year, year <laughs> did PW classes. But right, least, I like, transferred into my program after this year. That's, okay, that's, that's what I'm right. kind of. So you had two years in the program and three years overall. <laughs> I just got rid of Right, but my my first year really did count towards it. So it's not for this year. So I'm kind of on track for the next semester. That's true. I'm sorry to say, but you yeah, we did that too. Which is so much on me because now we're reading exam. Do you have to do a reading exam? We don't. Okay, it's really nice. So I'm doing a reading exam now. It's yeah. terrible. And it was fine to just be like, you read for all of the summer and then do the exam. And now it's read while teeing and taking a class and doing my work. Yeah. I thought that really died. So sad. Oh, I'm going to charge that. <laughs> Do you have your committee all set in the Um, I have my reading time committee set, I don't have my committee set. Oh, so they could be different. There, so one of them is only one of them two people in your PI, and the other one is three people in your PI. Okay. Yeah. Usually you want to take the same yeah. person when I have to know what I'm doing. Well, thanks. How are you? Thank you. 
Do you think that pretty much everyone is here? I feel yeah. like maybe not yet, right? I don't know. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 North Carolina on Tuesday at a, a grant meeting, and uh, I'm very lucky that I flew back um, that day because all the other people who were at the meeting um, tried to fly back yesterday, including my land manager Donius and some other people, and now they're all completely stranded. Have you guys seen? Mm -hmm. So, and although I, you know, I had the physics, uh, you know, uh, John Lee very kindly gave the physics lecture on Tuesday. I didn't have anything lined up for a substitute for today, so I please didn't get snowed in. But um, so. Uh, so thank you for, um, for uh, sending your um, thoughts on the project, and I'm in the, they, they deserve a lot of thought, I'm in the process of replying to them. But one of the, no matter what, what type of project you're doing, whether it's, um, whether it's kind of doing like a grant review type idea for a study, or whether it's um, analyzing uh, an existing data set, uh, one important question is, what do people know about this topic so far, and kind of you know what remains to be found out? Now, this this is something which how many please, which of your undergrads I think like at least like like uh, a few. Years. So so I'm guessing that those of you who are undergrads are probably haven't done much of this, and those of you who are grad students, some of you have probably do this like for like hours every day, and some of you. May not have done it so much. So let's just. I think it, this is primarily for the undergrads' benefit. But it might be helpful to everyone uh, to just kind of spend just a minute or two, just exploring. Okay, you've got a question. How are we going to find out? Kind of, you know, or at least find out where to look for for what's known about it and what isn't known about it. So, so how about one of you who's who's an undergrad um, suggests like what was the kind of question? We can basically do some of your homework for you now. It's like an exercise. So what was the, so one of you, say what the question was that you were kind of interested in, in exploring for your, uh, for your project, and we can, as a kind of class as an exercise, look, try and find out, you know, what's known about it, what isn't known about it, what would be a good place to start looking into it. And, and for those of you who, you know, have are graduate students and may probably have done this a lot already, you know, you can uh, you can just uh, you know tune out or watch and remind yourself how things used to be <laughs> when you were young or something. So, uh, so would anyone like uh, would anyone like us to do uh, do some some investigative homework for them? It doesn't have to be an undergrad, but I think it might be good if it is. Uh, so, any any volunteer for having having some work done for them? I was kind of anticipating that that would make people want to volunteer. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, we can also pick a question. Yes, okay. Okay, sure. Um, this is the question that we sent you? Well, or, you know, it doesn't have to be. Or just the question that you, uh, that you were interested in doing a project on. Or it could be just a question that, you know, you happen to find yourself, you know, musing about this morning while you were, you know, having breakfast or something. But just, uh, you know, if there's some, some question about, about the book. But, you know, if you do the one that's, uh, that's, uh, that's for your project, then we'll be doing some work for you. Or if you do another one, then... Then we'll be doing something else of interest. But just just how one would set about how one would set about trying to find out what's what's known and you know what would be a good resource to look at it. And am I, am I just am I right in thinking that, that as an I certainly when I was an undergrad I didn't used to do this kind of thing. But of course, you know, that was a long time ago. But uh, am I right in thinking that the undergrads probably haven't done too much of actually, you know, of figuring out how to explore the literature. Maybe even some of the grad students haven't done that much of that either. I, uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, I've had pretty decent exposure to. You know, okay. We, we had okay. Yeah. Everyone already knows how to do this? 
Is that really true? I, it might be. Okay, well that's impressive. So, because uh, I, well, okay, that's very interesting. We can skip this and that's totally fine. So, so if I wanted to say, you know, uh, find a recent review article on a given topic and all the papers that cite it, you would know how to do that? It's not embarrassing to say no. I'm very impressed that everyone knows that. I totally thought this would be something that people would have to learn how to do. Okay, well that's great. Well, in that case, we can skip on to the next topic. I'm, I'm very actually pleasantly, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm showing my ignorance here. I'm very pleasantly surprised that as undergrads you, you, you're doing that already. Is that, because I remember, you know, it just being more kind of like, turn to chapter eight of the textbook. And, uh, oh, well, that's, that's wonderful. How things have progressed. And do you still write with like a quill and you dip it in? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, in that case, we can skip to skip to the next. So we spent a little bit of time uh, in looking at MATLAB in the classifier, but I totally kind of rushed over that. So I think I think it's good to spend a little bit more time thinking about what a classifier does, because that's kind of going to be a big theme. Of, of this class. So, and we already talked somewhat about about when you might need to use the classifier. We were talking about these examples of, uh, you know, what, say, an automated voice sensing machine on the telephone does, when that actually can work quite well if it's just trying to figure out if you're saying arrivals or departures, when it, you know, will be utterly unable to deal with what you're talking about at all if you have some kind of open-ended question it's not just picking from some small subset of possible answers. So let's look a little bit more at the kind of mechanics of what's going on. And, and just to kind of refresh, so um, uh, would anyone like to give a, like a little mini summary of, of why applying classifiers to uh, brain imaging data might be an interesting or worth, worthwhile thing to do. That's that's not a, that's not a trick question really. Some of you I think have already applied applied classifiers to, to imaging data. Or well, we've looked at it a little bit. But um Yes, okay. There you so, go. So uh, to try to this is different Tommy Tommy Blanchard. <laughs> uh, to Thank try you, to differentiate two um, different uh, states that uh, a particular um, area of the brain might be in. Okay. Um, you know, where a state can be anything from an attentional state uh, or, um, you know, different stimuli being uh, observed. <coughs> or, okay, or, no, excellent, excellent. That's, that, that's exactly right. So, and, and one of the key points here is that there's different ways in which something can be in different states. So, a brain area, you know, the simplest possible way for a brain area to be in two different states is one for it to be active, all the voxels are you know, giving you a high bolt signal, and the other for it to be inactive, all the voxels are just giving you a baseline bolt signal. And uh, you know, on Tuesday you'll learn a little bit more about how such signals are made. Um, but uh, but that's, that's kind of you know, the, the simplest possible, possible way in which something can be in two states. It's either like all active or all not active. And you can imagine all kinds of different ways in which something might change its state, but not necessarily in a way uh, that you'd be able to capture just by kind of looking at this total amount of, of average local intensity. So a little bit like, for instance, you know, one, uh, one uh, metaphor that sometimes uses is, suppose you're, uh, trying to, you're kind of looking at different letters of text on the page and you're trying to tell the difference between some of those different letters. Well, if I wanted to tell the difference between, you know, the letter lowercase i and the letter m, I can just kind of count how much ink there is in, in that little section of the page, and I'll do just great. There's tons of ink in m, and there's not very much ink in lowercase i. Okay. But if I wanted to tell the difference, and so if I were just, you know, doing a kind of ink, if I just had an ink, local ink average intensity detector, then I would be absolutely great at distinguishing between those two letters. You know, uh, M would be like active, and you know, the ink region is active, and I would be less active. Okay? So, uh, uh, but as you can imagine, you know, what if I wanted to tell the difference between the letter M and the letter W? All right. Suddenly now my ink counting, ink activation detector isn't going to work too well. And in fact, well, actually, what would be even more worrying 
is it would work just fine and it would say these are the same letter. Right? Let's move on, nothing to see here. Okay? Well, you know, they ain't the same letter. So, uh, so it's looking at the pattern, especially, and, and similarly, you know, if you, if, you, if you were just looking at one pixel, you know, one dot on your little uh, computer screen, then on-off is all you can do. But as soon as you start looking at a pattern of them spread out across a little bit of space, if you're trying to see the difference between an M and a W, well, now suddenly you've got to look at a pattern. And that pattern is made up of, made up of a lot of little bits. It's made, you know, if you were to look at the pixels that make up an M or a W, there's probably you know, a couple of hundred of them. Okay? So, um, so you can think of, uh, of a classifier as uh, basically looking at a bunch of little things, namely, say, the dots in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the letters M on M, or, in, or the voxels in MRI image, and saying, let's look at the difference in the patterns between them. And the time when that comes out to be particularly useful is if the differences are of a sort which just kind of counting, you know, summing up o overall amount of ink, overall amount of intensity isn't really going to do it for you. Um, so, uh, so then the question is, well, that's you know, that's just a kind of hand wavy, hand wavy sort of description in, in metaphors, which hopefully is helpful for kind of understanding the, the broad picture of what it's doing. But what's actually going on there, and, and what 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 kinds of what kinds of patterns can you find? Or, you know, are some more difficult to find than others? Or, you know, well, what's the actual kind of mechanics of trying to find some of these patterns? So, so this, this is going to sound, some of this may sound, um, well, this is probably not too technical, but, uh, but some of the, we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of what, what that means. That's, that's the aim for, for some of this class. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, Well, I guess I don't really need to draw a picture of an M and a W, but uh, well, let's just draw a picture of an M and a W. Uh, okay, I was going to show everyone Google Scholar, but that's obviously not necessary now. Uh, wait, this is too hard to do on the mirroring panel. You have uh, a whiteboard right there. Yeah, can everyone see the whiteboard? That might shoot a bit better. Uh, don't worry about trying to get it on the video. Uh, Okay, so, oh look, I even have two colors, that's nice. So, um, okay, so let's imagine that we have this part of the brain that conveniently makes activation patterns that look like letters, M and W. Okay, so here's an M. Okay, here's W. And, uh, and suppose I have the whole thing kind of, you know, divided up into some kind of grid. Okay. So, let me actually wipe those bits off. Um, so some parts of this, some parts of this image are going to be more useful for telling the difference between an M and a W than other parts. I'm going to actually rewrite this to redraw this to make this a little, a little more extreme. So, so which, which parts of that, which parts of that picture are going to uh, contain some information about the difference between these two patterns, and which parts don't really contain much information about it? You can you can point to it if you want, or draw a ring around it or something. Yeah, Jared. The difference um, is more in between the two lines, because like on the, the central bit. Yeah, exactly. And on the edges, they're more similar. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that that. That one sentence there captures a great, that's you really summarize it perfectly, captures a great deal. So there's some parts of the image where these things are more similar, right? And there's some parts when they're less similar, okay? But the total amount of ink in each one is kind of different, okay? So, so you've got this kind of input space, right? Which is basically just, you know, imagine if this was divided into, say, you know, a 10 by 10 grid or something. So you've got 100 points in there, okay? Some parts of that, contain basically no information whatsoever about the difference between these two patterns. Basically, you know, the, the, the kind of vertical lines at the edge here, you know, the patterns are the same there. And some parts contain lots and lots of information. 
If you see uh, a little bit of, uh, of ink here, then you know that you've got a W and not an M. Or at least, if you know that the answer is either M or W, then you know that you have a W and not an M. You know, if the answer could be U, then you, you still don't know yet, but you, you can at least rule out some of it. Okay, so that's literally, you know, that's literally what uh, a, a classifier does. So it says, okay, I've got a whole bunch of different pieces of information coming in here, and some of them are gonna be very useful for telling the difference between the things that I care about. You, in this instance, we're telling the classifier what we care about. There's some instances where you don't do that. Uh, in this case, I care about, is this an M or a W? Um, and um, if it's a part, now supposing, okay, so suppose you wanted to kind of assign, you know, an importance value. Suppose I kind of divided this up into, you know, like a 10 by 10 grid or something, and I wanted to give some importance value to each of the elements in the grid, okay, then, the places where there's not really any information telling the two patterns apart, such as these kind of vertical lines here, we get assigned a very low importance value, a very low weight. Okay? And the parts that, that have a lot of information about different patterns, we get assigned a very high importance value, very high weight. And um, that's exactly what a classifier does. And then if you say, okay, so I've assigned some importance weights to different parts of this image in this case, and I want to make some overall decision okay, about, you know, am I seeing an M or am I seeing a W? Then what would be a kind of reasonable approach to take? Anyone want to? So one thing that you could, what you could basically just do is you could say, okay, I've assigned an importance weight to every single place. I'm going to now take a, basically a weighted sum. I'm going to say, what's going on here multiplied by how important it is? What's going on here multiplied by how important it is? You know, oh, there's some stuff here, but this area has zero importance. I don't care. Oh, there's a little bit of stuff here. This area is super important. I'm going to add that a lot to my overall value. Okay. So suppose I suppose I'm basically making a a um, I want to get the sum total of how much W-ness is there going on here. Okay, this is this is this sounds kind of handy, but this is exactly exactly what a classifier does. Okay, so it's say, dear classifier, how much W-ness is going on in this grid? You say, <coughs> okay, um, well there's something here, there's you know, there's a certain amount of ink here. Oh, but this part of the image contains no information whatsoever about W-ness or M-ness. Multiply that by zero. Okay, there's uh, say say there's you know where there actually is the W here and there's not the M. Okay, there's something here. Oh, this part contains a lot of information about W units. Multiply that by, you know, 10 or something, okay? Add it up. And then just get this running total of, of your kind of weighted sum, your kind of importance weighted sum of what's going on in the input as to how much you think it's an indicator of, um, of what the actual uh, target, the degree to which your target, in this case W, is present. And then that's your answer. And then you say, and then, and then the point, at that point, you say, you know, class one might come out and say, you know, okay, I've added it all up, and I think I have, you know, 58 units of importance, W importance weighted W-ness going on here. And I say, okay, well, so is there a W there, or is it an M? And then at that point, you know, you just have to basically set some threshold and say, yeah, well, okay, if it's, you know, between 0 and 50, we'll say that it's an M, and if it's between 50 and 100, we'll say that it's a W. Okay? So you have some kind of weighted, weighted sum. You, you divide the space up into units. You kind of attach a, an importance, well, literally a weight, to them, uh, and then you you take some kind of that that use those weights to get a weighted sum of what's going on in the input, and then you make some kind of decision. You say, "Yep, am I above threshold or am I below threshold?" And then that gives you what your answer is. So in that, you know, that in this case, in this illustration, it's a case of you know which letter is going on, but in other illustrations, it's going to be a case of which which neuron pattern is going on. Uh, so okay, so let's let's turn let's see if we can relate that to this kind of this description. Uh, so okay, so why do I say it's just like linear regression? Okay, so um, so uh, in linear regression, am I right in thinking that all of you have done linear regression? Probably, maybe not. Who had? Okay, you know there's actually a way that I only see of. Uh, because no one wants to stick their hand up and say, I haven't done linear regression, because that's kind of embarrassing. Okay. So, um, uh, 
So one, one way uh, is that uh, uh, I, I learned something. If if you have done uh, if you have done linear regression, then hum hum gently. Okay. <laughs> And the intensity of the humming is an indicator. I know it sounds silly. Okay, but then why is this good? Okay, because you can't look at someone and see if they're humming. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so everyone who's done linear regression, hum gently. <laughs> I mean, I think most people who've done linear regression. Most people have done linear regression. In like a simple stats class, it's just like you're pretty much like your y equals mx plus b line, right? The okay. Best fit. Wow. But that doesn't really mean that you can do model. That you definitely know what's going. Okay, good. Okay. By the way, you, you hum very nicely. I really just want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recruiting for a hum chorus note. Okay. Um, so okay. So in linear regression, you're basically doing exactly the same thing. You're taking, you're saying, you know, suppose I want to predict, you know, how likely is someone to die of lung cancer, and my input variables are, you know, how many cigarettes do they smoke per day, and how old are they, and, you know, I don't know, what's their body mass index or something like that, okay? Then, uh, uh, you know, some of those are going to be pretty much irrelevant to lung cancer. Body mass index might be relevant to some things, but it's not very relevant to lung cancer. How many cigarettes they smoke per day, highly relevant to lung cancer, okay? So, so what the, what the statistical model will do is it will take each of those input elements and say, how much importance weighting should I attach to that? Okay. And then, uh, so you, know, you might have a weighting of 10 to whether somebody, you know, number of cigarettes that somebody smokes, and a weighting of zero or you know, just some small number to body mass index and you know, whatever, you know, weight some in-between weighting to what their age is. And then, and then you just, take all of those input variables, weight them by whatever those importance values are, and say this is my overall prediction for the degree of lung cancer risk of you know, this particular patient. Okay. So it's actually exactly <coughs> the same thing. But notice that I'm just describing so far, well I'll show in a minute a couple of pictures, but so far I'm just describing a linear classifier. And linear, and, and this was you know, one of the questions. Um, so, uh, so it really is as simple. A linear classifier is just one that draws a straight line. Okay, but it turned, there is a relation between that and this idea of like weighted summing. Okay, so um, so we talked about this example the other day of uh, of suppose I'm trying to tell the difference between uh, sumo wrestlers and and basketball players. So so in the M and W example, the input dimensions were I've got you know this grid of pixels and some of them are colored in. You know, for making the, the, the drawing the font of uh, uh, the letter M, and some of them are colored in for drawing the letter W. In the uh, this is a little bit more like the, the cigarette smoking and lung cancer example, because in this case, in that case, the input dimensions were with different sources of information. Okay, so you know, how many cigarettes does someone smoke? In this case, the sources of information we just have two dimensions here, uh, height and weight. Okay, so. So a linear classifier, it's as simple as that, it just means it just draws a straight line. So, you know, we talked about how you do some kind of weighted sum, and then you have to actually make a decision. You know, it's one thing to say, I think I've got 58 units of W-ness in this, in this part of the computer screen. But, you know, we don't care about that. We care, is this a W or is this an M? Okay. So, you know, give me some threshold. If it's above 50, it's a, we're going to call it a W. If it's below 50, we're going to call it an M. Okay. So here, that's exactly what this is doing. So I've, so so some classifier is saying, hmm, I'm trying to figure out whether a given person is a basketball player or a sumo wrestler. So in this particular instance, it looks like height and weight are kind of being given equal importance. Let me show an example in just a minute. Okay, so it might be that some some dimensions are more important than others. Okay. So in this case, you see that the slope of the line has changed a little bit. So in this case, um, height is really important. Okay, if I change, if I change my height by just a little bit, my position with respect to this line could change quite a lot, right? I could go, uh, you know, I could go kind of from here to here, and and that changes that that changes very likely to cross this line. Okay, whereas 
the weight dimension, well, it's a bit confusing because I'm talking about weights, uh, weights being applied to dimension, but let's call this, you know, I don't know, kilograms or something. The kilograms dimension uh, is less important in this case because I could change, you know, I could slide up and down here a little bit and it's, it's less likely to cross the line. I'm more likely just to kind of run more or less parallel to the line. Okay. So, um, uh, so this would be, so imagine, uh, Imagine, say, this was number of cigarettes smoked per, per day, and this is, say, I don't know, you know, yearly income or something, okay? And, and this is people who are likely to get lung cancer, and this is people who are not likely to get lung cancer, okay? If you change your number of cigarettes smoked a little bit, you're quite, you know, you're, you're going along this direction, quite likely to cross this line from the people who are less likely to the people who are more likely. But, you know, cancer doesn't really care how much you earn. It might, you know, your treatment might, but whether you get it might not. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can go up and down this axis, and it's not really going to make much difference. So different dimensions can, can be assigned different importance. And to say that uh, uh, classifies linear literally just means it's drawing a line. Now, this leads to the obvious question, what about nonlinear classifier? Okay, well, it just means it's drawing a not straight line, okay, such as a curve. Uh, so, now, there's another sense of linear that you've probably encountered. Linear and nonlinear, by the way, are terms that get thrown around a lot uh, and don't always get thrown around in like, the senses that they actually genuinely have. Okay? So, so, there's another sense of, so linear often gets thrown around to mean kind of like, I mean, it's actually correlated with these meanings, but it's not actually exactly what it means. It's to mean something like kind of simple or straightforward. And nonlinear often gets thrown around to mean something like, you know, fancy or sophisticated or mysterious or something. Okay? And it is certainly the case that if all you're going to do is, if you're going to divide the world up by drawing a straight line through it, you're definitely doing something simpler and more direct than you are if you decide to draw some kind of curve, okay? But, um, but it's not necessarily the case that, uh, that you know, something, say, that's nonlinear is, is extremely complicated or fancy. I mean, you could draw some, you could draw a very simple curve, like you could just draw like a circle, right? And say everything within the circle is class A, everything without, outside the circle is class B. That's, that's, that's a fairly simple thing that you could be doing, but it's still nonlinear just because it's not a straight line. So, um, so what does this have to do with weighted summing? Well, if all you're doing, if all you're doing uh, in order to decide, you know, what 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 category am I going to assign people to? If all you're doing is um, assigning some importance weight to one dimension and assigning some other importance weight to another dimension, and just adding them up and multiply, multiplying them by those multiplying the inputs by those weights and adding them up. That's linear in this other sense that actually turns out to, to match perfectly with drawing a straight line. That's linear in the sense that if I put in twice as much stuff, I get twice as much out. Okay? So if I'm just, uh, or if I put in n times as much stuff, I get n times as much out. Okay? So, uh, so if, if, someone, if, I, if I've assigned a weight of you know, three to height, if I think that you know, height is you know, three times more important than weight, then if someone comes along and they're, and they're four foot tall, then the weighted sum that's going to get come out of that will be just half as much as if someone comes along and they're eight foot tall. Okay. Now, so you can already see why, why a linear point of view is not necessarily capturing everything in the world, because if someone comes along and they're eight foot tall, then there's something very strange going on medically with that person. You know, they're not just kind of twice as much further along the line as someone who's four foot tall, who's probably, you know, like uh, 12 years old or something. Okay. So, uh, so and, and I think that, uh, I'm not really certain, but I kind of think that some of the, some of the confusion, there's a lot of confusion around the terms linear and nonlinear, I think just because they kind of get used in loose metaphorical sense a lot. And I think that some of that may have come across in some of the answers that you sent me, because and this is, into, you know, this is not at all a criticism because one of the main reasons why I send these questions is because to help me try and figure out, like, you know, where where there might be areas in need of clarification. 
So quite a lot of the answers, and I, I, you know, I just want to emphasize this is not, I'm not trying to criticize this answer, because it's actually a correct answer. Um, quite a lot of the answers said something like, uh, uh, a classifier is linear if the output is a linear function of the inputs, and a classifier is nonlinear if the output is a nonlinear function of the inputs, which is, which is, of course, a true statement, but which doesn't really quite capture you know, a basic, a kind of simpler way of saying the same thing, which is a classifier draws a straight line and a nonlinear classifier draws a non straight line. So I kind of felt, because like the answer sort of just kind of restated the question, I kind of felt like maybe that indicated that, uh, that maybe the answer wasn't entirely clear to you. So I'm ho my hope is that this actually makes it a little bit clearer. Okay, now, uh, now I just mentioned an example of a uh, of, of when, uh, so linear, linear apart from meaning draws a straight line, in its more kind of mathematical sense, it means you know you put in n times as much, you get n times that, that much out. If you put in zero, you get zero. Okay. So um, also it means if you, if you want to get into all of it, uh, if, uh, if you put in, uh, you know, uh, if you put in a and b together, then what you get out is the function of a plus the function of b. Nothing, nothing kind of weird happens with a and b interacting with each other. They just add up on top of each other. So remember we were talking about, uh, about hemodynamic response functions, and we said how uh, you guys got to explore in the, uh, in the computer practical, uh, kindly run by Dan, thank you very much. Um, what happens if you start overlaying Overlaying these hemodynamic response functions on top of each other, you know what happens if uh, two successive stimulus events are not you know 18, 20 seconds apart from each other? What happens if they're only five seconds apart from each other, and one of them kicks up when HRF that goes like this, and it hasn't finished coming down yet when the next one comes along? Okay, well, they literally the the HRFs you can with, to a reasonably good approximation just treat them as if they just add up on top of each other, and that just adding up on top of each other. Is an, uh, people refer to that as the ball signal being linear, and that just and that's that's linear in the same sense as which this is drawing a straight line, but it's kind of it, you know manifests itself a little bit differently because this being a straight line just means that I just apply some amount of weight to this dimension and just add it up with some amount of weight to that dimension, and then I see where I am for, with that total weighted output, and then I apply some kind of the bit when you actually apply a threshold and you say, am I on this side or am I on that side, that's not linear, okay, because that takes everything and it just gives you a yes or no answer out. Okay? It doesn't give you, you know, two yeses and three yeses and four yeses, if you, it just gives you two possible answers. So, um, so things just, just plain old adding up with each other means that something's linear. So, so you might say, well, some things in, in life do kind of just plain add up with each other. I mean, you know, forget forget hemodynamic response functions for a minute, but uh, let's see, what's an example of something? Okay, can, can anyone give me an example of, of things? It's, it's probably easier to think of things, well, maybe, okay, maybe both are equally, this requires kind of thinking about the world maybe in a slightly different way. What, what, are, what are things in the world that just, apart from HRFs and classifiers, would just plain all that up with each other? Fantastic. That's actually a very, very good example indeed. So if, if I've got, this is going to sound trivial, but it's actually not that quite trivial because when we get to the other examples, okay. Um, if I've got, uh, if I've got uh, one coin in my pocket and I put in another coin in my pocket, I've got two coins in my pocket. Okay. What are things which uh, don't necessarily just Add up with each other. What is it? Something. What is? Give an example of something which, where you put them together, and something a little bit different. You end up with something a little bit different than just the two things together. But you might put this another. Way. What are two things which, if you put them together in your pocket, you might not want to put them together in your pocket? A cat and a mouse. Yeah. There you go. Okay. There you go. Excellent. I like it. Okay. Um, thank you very much. These are very good examples. Okay. Now, I'm just getting a little metaphorical to say that, that, that if you put a cat and a mouse together, 
you know, it's not a linear interaction because you don't just end up with a cat and a mouse. But actually, I think it's a beautiful example. I really like it a lot. Okay. Now, what's the difference okay, between sticking two coins in your pocket and sticking a cat and a mouse in your pocket? I mean, well, that's a funny question, but let's say not in your pocket, but let's say put them in a the room. Okay. Okay. Well, what is it? What is it that the cat and the mouse do that the coins don't do? Interact. Exactly. Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay. They interact. Okay. So, so, you, so if you have two things that interact with each other, or more than two things that interact with each other, the world is full of things that interact with each other. In fact, if you wanted to kind of, you know, describe. You know, all the stuff in the world that's kind of hard to understand and uh, that's kind of complicated and that we don't really have a very good handle on, it's almost always lots of things interacting with each other. Right? Okay, if I want to, uh, if I want to um, predict, uh, you know, um, a ball running down a table, right, then I can just model the ball running down the table. It's nice and easy. Okay. If I want to predict uh, what's going to happen to the economy tomorrow, or what's going to happen to the economy a month from now or a year from now, okay, I have to try and figure out what's go or, or what the weather is going to be a week from now, or whether you know my flight from North Carolina is going to get cancelled tomorrow. Okay. I have to look at lots and lots of different things. All interacting with each other. Okay, so, so you know whether the economy picks up is a result of, you know, whether consumers feel confident and go to the shop, and whether when they go to the bank they can get enough interest rates, and whether they, you know, the customer at the shop where they work is getting is spending enough so they don't have to get fired, and you know, you name it. Okay, lots and lots of different things all interacting with each other, okay, and that's exactly where the world gets a little bit complicated. Whereas if you have things that don't interact with each other, like I really like this example of two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, you put two coins in your pocket and they just sit there and they're just two coins in your pocket, okay? So, so if, you can, if you can assume that things don't interact with each other, then you're gonna be in a much better shape to model and predict it, and the only slight problem is that, you know, the world is full of things that interact with each other. So. Uh, so with with hemodynamic response functions, okay, what's our assumption? Our assumption is that the hemodynamic response functions do not interact with each other. If you have one and then you have another one, you can just add them up. Okay? Now, as I said, this is an imperfect assumption, okay, but it turns out to be an okay assumption. We, I think we already gave an example of uh, of why this couldn't really be true. Because, so for instance, if I you know flashed a light uh, uh, you know, uh, twenty times in a row, okay, it might give you a little bit of a headache, okay. But uh, if, your, if your hemodynamic response functions literally just added up on top of each other, then if you flash the light 20 times in a row rapidly, you'd have this hemodynamic response function, this one, 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 and then you'd have an enormous, enormous amount of oxygenated blood flowing to that part of the brain. It would, you know, burst your blood vessel. Okay? So there's a kind of saturation effect. Okay? So things, instead of everything just adding up like a straight line, it, it tails off a little bit. Okay? So, um, so in fact, actually, you couldn't get better. So the, you know, although the mathematical definition of linear is, you know, a function f is linear if f of a x plus b equals, you know, a times f of x plus b and stuff like that. Okay, um, what it really means is, you know, the, the, something is linear if you can stick stuff in and they don't really interact with each other. What comes out is just what would have come out if you'd put them in separately. Okay, but if you stick in a cat and a mouse in a box together, probably only the cat's going to come out. Okay, so. Um, so why would you ever, you know, given that the world is, uh, is full of in things interacting, okay, so here's, now how are, how are height and weight interacting in this example? Okay, so, well, well, let's look at height and weight not interacting, okay? So height and weight are not interacting if I say, okay, if I know my height, I can just kind of take some weight and, you know, I'll assign an importance weight of two to it, multiply it by two and put that into my running total, and then I don't even have to worry about what the weight is when I look at that. I can just, and then I'll do the same thing for weight. I don't have to worry about what the height is when I look at that. Okay, then I get my total. Okay, but look what happens if you have a, um, a nonlinear boundary. Okay, so um,
So suppose I say, uh, let me let me make this a little cozy. Yeah. Let me give a better example. Here. So I, I kind of just extended the curve a little bit. So um, suppose I say, uh, now I try and just use height and I don't care about weight. And I say, oh, now let's use weight and not care about height. Okay? Suppose I say, yeah, somebody's weight is this much. Okay, they're, this, they're this level of weight on the, um, on the scale. You know, they're 150 pounds or something. Okay? What does that tell me about which part of, about whether they're on this side or that side of the, of the boundary? Well, it depends, right? Okay, because if I happen to be, if I happen to be, you know, on this line and I'm over here, okay, then I'm on this side of the boundary, but if I happen to be uh, this weight, but I'm of this height, I'm on this side of the boundary. If I happen to be this weight and I'm this height, now I'm on the other side of the boundary. <coughs> So I can't just look at weight on its own and say, oh, being of this particular weight, 150 pounds, gives me a certain indication of how likely I am to be on this side of the boundary. I have to look at the two things together, because I could be, any, I could be either here or here or here. Okay? So you actually have to look at the interaction of them. So you might say, well, you know, given that everything, the world is full of things interacting, there's a lot more things in the world that are like cat and mice than there are like uh, like putting two coins in a pocket. I have to say, I just, the more I think about that example, the more I like that example. I just want to thank you for that example. I just like that a lot. Mm. So, you know, does this mean you know how we were talking about? Well, you don't want to like oversimplify too much. You don't want to say oh, I can model the effect of a, you know, I can model the the aerodynamics of a chicken, uh, a chicken flying first assume a spherical chicken. If I, if I assume that everything, nothing interacts with anything else, you might say, this is just a ridiculous, ridiculous assumption. You know, why would that ever be a reasonable thing to do? Okay. So, um, uh, okay, so, so this, is, this is why that might be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, actually, it's probably easier to visualize, actually, in 2D. Okay. So, can you guys see the, the, um, the green line? So, green is often a little harder to... Yeah, okay, I think you can see that. Okay. So